famous words of Dorothy, there's no place like home. <laughs> Except I couldn't click my heels and get here. I had to drive 14 hours <laughs> with three kids. <laughs> so, <clears throat> praise God. I want to read you, a, a, somebody posted this on Facebook. They were, uh, and I don't normally read Facebook in church, but uh, this was somebody who visited the church and uh, last Sunday, and I wasn't here, but he, he wrote this, and I thought it was really a good compliment to our church. Um, he said, I was in town doing some work for a friend and checked out Sunday services. What I liked the most was that the preaching was straight out of the Bible. Amen? That's, a, that's good. That's, a, that's the best comment we can get. Amen? I mean, somebody says, oh, I liked your programs, but man, when they say preaching is right on, it's right out of the Bible, amen. That's what we want. And uh, if this is what you want, um, or if this is what you like, check out this growing church that would love to welcome new members, and this is a non-denominations church. So I thought that was a, a good encouragement. So I sent sent that to Mark. I hope he didn't get a big head. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't. <laughs> He's a humble soul. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> we're going to continue that. You know, I'm so thankful for our school. I don't know why other churches don't do Christian schools. You know, I mean, our, you know, I, I saw um, that in California that they mandated um, a class that has that would be teaching on LGB, uh, you know, and all this sexual stuff. That's mandated. And uh, you know what? Two words will fix that: homeschool or uh, Christian school. One of the two. So, you know, for the life of me, I, I think that uh, I, I don't. You know, when I'm in Texas, I see all these huge churches. They they have 10,000 people there on weekends, but during the week, there's nobody in their parking lot. You know, and uh, boy, they could really, really uh, educate some kids in those facilities. So, uh, this morning I want to go and preach on uh, Ephesians chapter two. And uh, a couple weeks ago, when I preached on Ephesians chapter one, I'll recap some of that. But the the uh, the audio CD is back there if you'd like to have that. But uh, the, the book of Ephesians, there, there is just so much in the book of Ephesians. It, it is just so deep, and there's so much. Uh, Paul was encouraging these Christians at Ephesus. It wasn't written to one place. It was like a circuit letter that was passed around there. But he spent three years there in Ephesus. And, and uh, you know, so I, I believe that he developed some really strong relationships with those people there. And, uh, and, and you, you just see Paul's heart as he's writing this letter to him. And uh, it says in verse 15, 115, I'll just recap some of this. He says, Wherefore also I have heard of your faith and the love of, Je of, the, of all the saints. Cease not to give thanks uh, for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So you see Paul's heart there, that he was, he was praying for them. He, they were on his heart, and, and he... Uh, he kept them before the Lord, and uh, he labored. He had labored and watched and wept for both uh, the community and the individuals there in Ephesus. And uh, also in verse 16, 116, he says, uh, he, he mentions, I cease not to give thanks and make mention of you in my prayers. And then he, he prayed this prayer for him. He said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you. And what, what he was saying is, is he was praying that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may impart something to you. He may impart something to you. And, you know, we could, we could give you all kinds of things. We could entertain you. We could, you know, uh, give you a meal. But when God imparts something to you by his spirit, it will change your life. It will change your life. Uh, Elaine was telling me that she went to uh, uh, a women's meeting over there at First Baptist, I forgive you, 
And uh, <laughs> and and the lady who was given the testimony said she got saved in a dream. Saved in a dream. I mean, you know, when when God imparts something to somebody, it changes their life because it's His Spirit imparting something to them. And Paul was saying, man, you know. He, he said, for this reason, I'm, I'm praying for you that God would just impart something to you, that he would give you something. And, and that's what I've been praying for the church. You know, because sometimes I don't know how to pray for people. I, oh, Lord, I know so-and-so's car broke down, fix your car. But maybe God, it's better that I pray God impart something to them. Just get, just bless them and, and, and give them something from your spirit. And so Paul is praying that the spirit of wisdom, he, he's praying that, that God would give them, uh, impart something to them, the, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You know, I was, I was reading... I read this, and I was reading chapter 1 and, and, and chapter 2, and I listened to it four or five times and just wanted to get it in my heart. And in some of the things, Guy, that we talked about last week or a couple of weeks ago uh, about election and different things, it, it's, it comes so clear in Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, so... God would give unto you, he was praying that God would give unto you the spiritual, that, you're, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the expectation of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See, God wants to reveal that to us. He wants to reveal to us uh, the expectation of his calling in our lives and, and, and what the riches are of the inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power. See, God's given us power. And he says, I, I want them to, to understand the exceeding greatness of the power that I've placed upon them by the Spirit of God. And to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Paul was laboring in prayer for them that God would impart something to them. And the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? You know, ever since I've, I've read this and, and, uh, and uh, preached the message on it, that's, that's, it changed the way I pray for people. It changed the way I pray for people because I could pray for, for things, but when I pray that God would move in their life and impart something to them, you know, I remember reading a story about Jim Sabala. He, uh, he, he uh, what's the name of that church? The Brooklyn Tabernacle, yeah. And uh, his wife started the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. She was an eight, ever not even able to read a note, you know, but they've won so many awards and everything. But he had a daughter who was just uh, uh, a teenager, I think, and she went off the deep end, went out and got into drugs and drinking and everything. And she was at a bar one night, and they had a, it was a Tuesday night, and they had a Tuesday night prayer meeting at their church. And some lady said, I feel like we're supposed to pray for your daughter tonight. And they began praying for her. And she was sitting at a bar, and the Holy Spirit just got a hold of her while she was sitting on that bar stool. She, she got out of there, and she went home, and she, and she repented before the Lord. You see, God could do so much in a moment and that what would take us t 10 to 15 years to do. And so I, I've changed the way I pray. I'm praying, God, get a hold of them, impart something to them. Do something in their life, Lord God. And uh, it might be in a dream. It might be, you know, it, it might be some kind of a supernatural move. But, but God still moves in that way today. And so I believe that we could pray that. 
Okay, so we're going to move on to chapter 2. Now we're just going to read. There, there's just so much in this book of Ephesians, just so much. <clears throat> and you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince and power of the air. In other words, you serve the devil. And uh, you, you lived in sin. That's what he's saying. The spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom you were all once lived in, the passion of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were, and were by nature the children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So that's, that's the way we used to be. We were dead in our sins. We lived after the flesh. And uh, let me read this to you. I got out of this commentary. Uh, it says, To be spiritually dead does not mean that we are physically dead, socially dead, or uh, physiologically dead. Yet it is, a, it is a real death, uh, a dead death, nothing less. The most vital part of man's personality is the spirit. Is the, the spirit is dead to the most important factor in life, and that's God. Not in a moral sense or not in a, a mental sense, but in a spiritual sense. Poor humanity is dead, so the, world of, so the word of God uh, again and again. Spur that was from Spurgeon. But he said that the worst kind of death is a spiritual death. It's not to be alive unto God. The Bible says that you were dead, but now you're alive unto God. Aren't you glad that we're alive unto God? That's why you could feel his presence. That's why you could understand his word is because we've been made alive unto God. And and there's, there's nothing uh, more uh, gratifying than being able to fellowship and being alive unto God. But he says that this is, this is the way we were before. The Bible uses many different t pictures, terms to describe the state, the state of the unsaved man. He says that we used, the Bible says that we used to be blind. I mean, we were blind to the things of God. We used to be a slave to sin. I remember just being a slave to sin. Whatever your body wanted you to do, you went out and did. You went out and got drunk, and first thing you did when you get up is you smoke a cigarette. You know, you, whatever your body wanted, that's what you did. You were a slave to it. You were blind to the things of God. That's why the, that song, Amazing Grace, I once was blind, but now I see. And... Uh, a slave to sin, a lover of darkness, sick. Mark 2, 17, the Bible says that the lost were sick. Uh, the Bible calls us lost, an alien, a stranger, and a foreigner, a child of wrath under the power of darkness. And so that's, that's what we used to be like. That's what we used to be like. And, you know, it's good to remember sometimes where you came from. It's good to remember sometimes where you came from. I mean, not to live in the past, but it's, it's good to remember what God brought you out of. Because I've, I've known some saints that after they get some victory under their belt, you know, and uh, they get this spiritual pride. And they don't realize that it's only by the grace of God you are what you are. I remember in the book of Acts when when Paul was doing miracles and they came to worship him and they thought he was a God, he rent his clothes and he said, man, I'm just like you. I'm a man. Only by the grace of God I, could, I am what I am. And so it's, it's good to remember. And, and this is where, what we used to be. We once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh and, and, and were by nature the children of wrath. So it's good to, to go back and say, yeah, that's what I used to be. I like this next verse, though, these next two words. What's the next two words? 
but God. It's all where you put your butt. But God. You <laughs> Everybody say that with me. But God. Being rich in mercy. He's he's rich in mercy. You you know that you know that God can give you mercy or he can withhold mercy? The Bible says that he gives mercy to whom he will. And so if you have received mercy by God, it's according to his riches. And you know, the, 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 the best example I got of that once was, you know, in the book of Esther, when Esther went before the king and and she didn't know if the king was going to let her speak to him or not. And, and if, if he held out his staff, then it, that was okay. She was able to come in and speak to the king. But if he didn't, she could be put to death. And so when we go to God, you know, he, he holds out that staff and he gives us mercy. And so mercy is, is given to you according to the riches of Christ. And he said, but God, I mean, after we've, we've had our life in the flesh and our conversations in the world, you know, when you listen to worldly people talk, they're talking about sports, they're talking about uh, all these other things, but they're really empty. And there's nothing wrong with talking about sports and all that stuff, but, but there's no life in all that. And, I mean, we used to be there. You know, all we could do is talk about the weather and, and talk about, you know, cars and talk about this and talk about that, things that are in the world. But God, who is rich in mercy, he brought us out of that, that death, that, all that dying stuff, and he brought us into a living relationship with him. And now we could talk about things of life, things that have eternal purpose. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were out there smoking and joking and doing all these other things, you know, God's, that's when God still loved us. It wasn't when, you know, sometimes you talk to somebody about the Lord and and they say, well, I'm not ready yet. I got to quit this and I got to quit that. And, you know, I got to clean up. No, God loved you right where you're at. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead, we were flat out dead in our sins, spiritually dead in our sins. And in our trespasses, what did he do? What did he do, church? He made us alive. Isn't that good? He made us alive. We were dead unto sin, but now we're alive unto God. Hallelujah. I said we were dead unto sin. <laughs> <laughs> but now we're <laughs> alive unto God. <laughs> it was like, oh yeah, amen. <laughs> and, and you know, the Bible says, if that same spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwells in you, it shall also make your mortal body alive. Amen. You, you've got the spirit of God inside of you. You know, I got here this morning, I didn't feel like preaching no more than the man in the moon. But I've got the Spirit of God and the anointing of God, and that's what I preach from. I don't preach from my feelings or my emotions. I preach by the power and the Spirit and the anointing of God. And that Spirit dwells in you. And if we allow our emotions to overtake us and, and, and guide us and direct us, we won't do a thing for the kingdom of God. Have you ever felt like you didn't want to preach? 
<laughs> I know we've seen them on Facebook. Oh, we're all sick. Help us. <laughs> But you do it anyway, don't you? you? You just get a hold of God's word and, and depend on God's anointing and, and you get up there and then you do it. And that's the same way it is when you get up in the morning and you don't feel like going to church. The devil says, oh, it's so beautiful out. Why don't you go fishing? Say amen or oh me. But you need to say, no, devil, this is God's day and I'm going to go and be with God's people and I'm going to fellowship and I'm going to praise God and I'm going to get encouraged and I'm going to be built up because I'm going to beat the heck out of you the next week. But we let our emotions and our feelings, you know, I don't feel like reading the Bible. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like worshiping. And you know, those things hit you most on Sunday morning, especially when you walk in here. I don't feel like lifting my hands. Well, you, you do it anyway. Hallelujah. And the devil gets mad every time you, you go against those emotions and those feelings. I don't know how we got there, but... But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. You know, when I see dead people come in here, they come in here, you know, they're strung out on drugs, they're heroin addicts. And, you know, I talked about the potter last or a couple of weeks ago and, how when he, when he gets ready to make that vessel and it's just a lump of clay, that he sees that finished product, you know? And, and I've had dead people walk in here and, you know, they say, oh, I want to get off drugs and, you know, I'm at the end of my rope and I get all excited because in my spirit, I see what the potter wants to do with that clay. And... And I think, oh, man, you know, I, I can't express myself to show them what God wants to do in their life if they just give him a chance. And that's why let all the dead people come in this church that want to because, you know, God wants to transform them. He, he wants to take that clay and he wants to make it a vessel of honor. And so... Even when we were dead and in our trespasses and sins, don't don't close anybody out because they're dead in their sins. There's a young man that was here Wednesday night, and uh, I was glad to see him. You know, even though he's he's done a lot of bad things, uh, I still have hope for him. So, um, so even how many know dead people? They're 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 dead, spiritually dead. But don't block them out. You know, show them love, and believe God to impart something to them. Hallelujah. Because you were once dead in your sins, you were. And if it wasn't for the grace and the love of God, you wouldn't be here. You know, spiritually pride people, they just grieve my spirit. I, I, they just, you know, it, because it's only by the grace of God they're able to claim salvation. You know, they're able to pray for people. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace are you saved, and have raised us up with him, seated us with him in heavenly places. Underline in Christ Jesus in your Bible. And then if you get time, 
go back and read chapter 1 and underline every time you see in Christ Jesus. It'll really open some things up to you. Because what he's talking about here is if we're in Christ Jesus. And even in chapter 1, when it talks about the, the works that he's got for us from the foundation of the world, it's in Christ Jesus. So there, there's some awesome things there. when you Just underline that, in Christ Jesus. So that at the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us. Where, where is that? In Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, having Christ in you is like pouring water in a glass, but you in Christ is like taking that glass and throwing it in the ocean. Think about it. So, in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved. I'm so, I lost all my notes. I'm way past my notes. I don't know. Okay. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared before the foundation of the world that we should walk in him. You know, Mark taught on uh, last week about the, what grace teaches us. And you know, there's so many aspects of God's grace. And the Bible, it says that that uh, 1 Peter 4.10, it says, Every man has received the gift, even so ministered the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Of the manifold grace of God. And the manifold grace of God, the word manifold means many aspects of God's grace. So there, there's many aspects of God's grace that's available to us. And uh, so that's the manifold grace of God. The Greek word is uh, pokolius, which means various types of his grace. And there's three aspects of God's grace that we're, we know of. Number one is his saving grace. How many have experienced his saving grace? Okay, for by grace are you saved. It's, it's unmerited favor. When you come to Christ, no matter what you're like or who you are, you know, God's by his grace, he saves you and cleanses you from your sin uh, by his grace. And then we have serving grace. I may have experienced God's serving grace. And uh, because the Bible says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So there's, there's, a, there's a measure of the gift of Christ that he gives you to serve in a specific area. And uh, I remember when I first started preaching, you know, I, I didn't have that grace until I really stepped into the position. And uh, I, I have grace to do this, but I don't have grace to do children's church. I don't have grace to work in the daycare. God's given that, given that to Mary. And if I would ask her to come up here and preach next Sunday, she'd probably have a fit. <laughs> I don't know she might be able to do it. Huh? I'm not going to neither. <laughs> I mean, I step in that daycare and I got to step out. <laughs> but, I mean, you guys notice that God gave you that grace the minute you made the decision to go out and minister the gospel. And, you know, when Peter got out of the boat, God gave him some grace to walk on water. 
But he never would have got the grace unless he got out of the boat. And so whenever we step into serving grace, God's grace is always there to follow the act of obedience to step out and, and do what he's calling us to do. So we have serving grace, we have, sa- uh, we have saving grace, we have serving grace, and then we have sufficient grace. You know, Paul prayed that God would remove this, this problem that he had. Some say that it was eyesight, and, you know, there's a, others speculation. And he sought the Lord three times for it, and God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so, also in in 2 Corinthians, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have an all sufficiency in all things, may be able unto abound unto every good work. So God's grace is there for you, his sufficient grace, his serving grace, and his, uh, his sufficient grace, his serving grace, and his salvation grace. Is, is readily available to every person. So it goes on to say, for we are his workmanship. Has anybody ever told you that you are really um, a work of art? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, listen to this. Listen to this. This is, this is, this is awesome. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship, which translates in the ancient Greek the word P-O-I-E-M-A. And the idea is that we are his beautiful poem. Isn't that good? We are his beautiful poem. That's how that translates. And then in the Jerusalem Bible, it the Bible translates workmanship as a work of art. Hallelujah. See, you are a work of art, James. You're a work of art. Tell that person next to you, you're a work of art, brother. <laughs> but I thought that was, that was really good, that we are his workmanship. We, we are a beautiful poem before him. We are a, a work of art. And every one of you in here is a painting of God, and you're all different. But God sees you as, as his workmanship, as his work of art, his beautiful poem. You know, I was thinking about that after I, I preached the message about the clay and the potter and... and uh, and I remembered when I was in, uh, in, in um, I think it was Branson, and I walked into one of those pottery houses. And there was so, and, and the guy, I was trying to get him to come to church and do a pottery class, and so I wouldn't talk to him. And, but he was back there doing his, his wheel and everything. And, and then outside in the shop was all these beautiful vessels that he made. I mean, they were just awesome. They're some of all kinds of different colors and different shapes, and I just walked around. I was just awestruck that this guy could do that. And, you know, God's church is like that. When all these, you know, I look in here, and I, you know, I know all of you, but you're all a workmanship of God. He he created you. He's he's shaped you. You know, me and Paul were, were talking about at the table this morning, and and, and he mentioned James. And, uh, and he said, oh, God has done such a wonderful work in his life. He, he's really, I mean, and then he said, I really didn't like being around him when he first got here. <laughs> <laughs> but stand up, brother. All right. look, look, he's a work of art. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> look at him. He's... He's God's beautiful poem. Look at him. <laughs> you, might, you might come in here on Sunday and say, oh, that's Brother James. No, that's God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. 
And, and, and so I, I imagine myself to be in the potter's house, and I look at all these vessels, and some of your lives I know, and I, I say, whoa, how did God do that from a lump of clay? How did, how did he do that? There's two lumps of clay that's been in the body of Christ a long time, and, and God's shaped them, and, and, you know, they're stable. They're, you know, they're, they're a work of art. We're glad to have them, amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. And so, it, you know, I just, I just picture that, being in the potter's house when I come to church on Sunday and just seeing all the wonderful works God has done here. And he's not, he's not finished yet. You know, go out and get some clay. Go out and bring in some lumps of clay to church. I always say, you catch them, we'll clean them, you know. Bring them in here. I don't care what they look like or, or what they're doing or what they're going through. Bring them in here and let God begin to shape them and form them. Praise God. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And then it says, it says that we're created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has before, uh, beforehand that we should walk in them. So when do, you discover, when do you discover the works God has created for you to do? Okay, but when do you discover them? Okay. What, what did I say to underline? In Christ. Listen to this. For we are his workmanship created in Christ. Jesus, for good works, which he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We discover them in Christ. You're not going to discover them living in sin. But when you come to, come to God, the Bible says if you lose your life for my sake, you're going to find it. And when we lose our life and we give our life to Christ, then we walk in to the preordained works that God has got for us. It's all explained in chapter 1. I mean, I read chapter 1. I go, whoa, that, that really kicks. You know, that, that was awesome. <laughs> So, in Christ, these things are pre prepared before the foundation. You know, I also th thought of this illustration one time. If, if I was very rich, and uh, I, I was watching this, this, this thing about the guy who owns Hobby Lobby, you know, Christian man, just tremendous, tremendous uh, man of God who started that. But anyway, you know, and I had a son. And when he got old enough, I was going to give him this company, you know, and he would be set for life. And, and he would find all of, you know, he would run the company and he would manage it, you know, and all the employees. And if he would will to do that, then all this is his, you know. I got his life planned out for him. But if he chooses to go the other direction, and live for himself, and live in the world, and get into drugs, and, and make a disaster out of his life, he doesn't come into the works that were preordained for him. And, and I used to, I struggled with that for years, you know, Calvinism and, and Armenianism, I struggled that, that for years, and, and God gave me that illustration. And then when I read chapter one the other day, it was just like, wow, it's in Christ. And, and that's why the, the Bible says we are his workmanship. God's, God wants to take that clay and, 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 and save them and wash them by their blood and, and create in them a, a new man and, and bring them into the preordained works that God has for them. See, we're, 
Your, your goal when God saved you wasn't just to get you to heaven. You're, you're saved unto good works. You're saved to do something. You're, you, we do stuff because it, it's what God has done. It's like an action and a reaction. I, I cannot be not ministering because of what God's done in my life. See, we're saved unto good works. And we can't sit around on our blessed assurance until we go to heaven. God wants us and he's called us to do something in the kingdom of God. Got awful quiet in here. So, I'm just going to forget about these notes here. Therefore, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, what is called the circumcision, which is made by the flesh and by the hands. Remember that you were at times separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. And here it is again, but now in Christ Jesus. I love that. But now, see, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He is our peace. Who has broken down the middle wall in the flesh, dividing the wall of hostility by the abolishment of the law and of the commandments expressed in the ordinance that he might create in himself one new man. You know, the this was written to, you know, a Gentile church and there was Jews and Gentiles and there was always that division there. But what Paul's saying here is that God has created it, one new man. You're not a Jew and a Gentile. You're a new person in him. And uh, in in place of the two, so making peace that he might reconcile us both uh, to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Uh, you know, I was, I was listening to a, a sermon by Jonathan Edwards who, uh, who, who wrote this sermon and it was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, and it was, it was quite eye-opening. But uh, he came and preached peace to you who were afar off. You know, when, when you get saved, you come into the kingdom of God and you, you've made peace with God. You're, you're no more under his wrath, you know. And uh, that's real peace. You know, the Bible says the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind. And uh, so he says that, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and preached to those who were near. For through him, we both have, see, it's all in Christ and through him. We both have access into one spirit to the Father. So, there, so that you are no more strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Amen. You saint, I don't know, I don't know any saints, but I'm fellow citizens with them. You know that there's a dog saint? Saint Bernard. <laughs> so then you are no more strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God and are built upon the, the apostles and prophets see we're, we're built upon God's word and that's why it's so important to preach the God's word. Uh, apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. See, Jesus is the chief cornerstone in the church in whom the whole structure being joined together. See, we're, as a church, Jesus is the cornerstone. And we're being, the Bible says that we're living stones and, and so we're being shaped and we're formed together. And the reason God's doing that, that we could grow into a holy temple in the Lord, in him, you also being built together 
into the dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the number one goal for a church is have is to have Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. He's the decision maker. He is the Lord. It's his church. And then as we all come together, we're built together. And the reason we're built together is for a habitation of the Spirit of God. So when people come in here that aren't saved, they feel the presence of God. And, and God convicts them of their sin. And he does something life-changing in their life. You know, I would rather see that happen than have all the programs in the world and, and all the psychedelic lights and, and all, all, all this other stuff. If we could just get the, the presence of God in this place as we're being built together, then God will do miraculous things. Amen. So that's Ephesians chapter 2. And... Uh, and I, and I hope that gets in. Read, read it. You, you never get it just listening to it. Read it and read it and read it. You know, you, we've got so much available to us. You can get it, download it free on your, on your phone, the Bible apps where you can listen to it. You can walk around listening to the Bible and get it in your spirit. And God will begin to reveal things to you. But Ephesians is a very, and, and I might just stay in this book for a while, but it's a, it's a powerful powerful book of instruction let's pray father i thank you uh, for your word which is quick and powerful sharper than to it any two-edged sword piercing to the dividing of the sunder of the soul and spirit and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart so lord i pray that you would uh, help us to engraft your word into our lives lord god that uh, it would it would change us and uh, it would draw us closer to you and that we would find our purpose and, and walk in, in, in uh, the works that you have uh, founded for us, Lord God. And Lord, I pray for everyone in here, God, that you would impart something to us this week, Lord. As we're in your word, as we're worshiping you, Lord God, that you would impart a spiritual blessing to us, God, that something of your spirit, God, that will change us, a revelation an understanding, uh, a healing, a, 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 a blessing of our emotions, God, that you would uh, put them in check, Father. Whatever it may be, I pray that you would impart something uh, to your people this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, I've been trying to curve the fat off of my message, and I, I did 15 minutes of fat trimming today. <laughs> so you got 15 minutes to fellowship or whatever. <laughs>